Good afternoon again, everyone. We'll give it uh, 30 to 45 seconds here to get everyone in the room. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll give about 30 more seconds here. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you once again for joining us for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Today's webinar is on BWF regulation and blood outgrowth endothelial cells. My name is Brett Spitali, and I'm the Vice President of Advancement here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. At any point during the webinar, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have NHF staff members monitoring these questions, which we will post to our presenter after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community beginning on Friday, December 10th. Today, we will also be live streaming on our LinkedIn and YouTube channels. I'm joined today by Dr. Christopher Ng from the University of Colorado School of Medicine, Children's Hospital, Colorado, the University of Colorado Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center. Thanks for taking the time to join us today, Chris, and I will now turn it over to you to get us started, sir. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Brett and uh, Dr. Valentino, for the uh, opportunity to present here. This is a um, fantastic, uh, you know, uh, lecture series that you guys have done, and um, I'm honored to be able to present. Today, we'll be primarily talking about um, the work that we do in my lab, which is on liver factor regulation in endothelial cells. Um, and up front, I'll talk, uh, I just want to acknowledge the funding sources um, that have supported this work. I'm currently supported by an NIH and NHLBI P01 award, um, but I also want to specifically mention the National Hemophilia Foundation, which has supported actually a, a, a big portion of my career, um, initially from a clinical fellowship award to the Judith Grant Pool Award, and then most recently a career development award. In fact, the career development award supported a lot of the work that's actually um, I'm going to be presenting today. So um, again, I'm very honored to speak and um, very honored to be uh, supported by the NHF in the past. All right, so we're gonna talk today a lot about von Willebrand factor. And given that this is the National Hemophilia Foundation and the kind of bleeding disorders community, I think many of you might be familiar with this protein, but just to set the base, because I know we have a little bit of a mixed audience here, um, VWF is a plasma glycoprotein that's essential in hemostasis. And it's found in two main places. It's found in endothelial cells and platelets. And it's now thought that over about 80% of your von Willebrand factor comes from your endothelial cells. It really makes those cells kind of the target cells to think about when we're talking about regulation of VWF. Now, when we think about von Willebrand factor and how it contributes to forming kind of a blood clot or kind of uh, achieving hemostasis, the classical teaching that we have is that areas of vessel injury expose subendothelial cell collagen. So this is kind of in your blood vessel here. And then what happens is plasma-based von Willebrand factor, which is floating around your blood, binds to that collagen, and then in turn binds platelets. And this starts the formation of the platelet plug, or kind of what we in hemostasis sometimes call primary hemostasis. And then on top of that, you start to get things like other coagulation factors, and you get kind of the structure of a fibrin clot. Now, von Rutherford factor also has one other really important function, and that's to stabilize and um, uh, protect factor eight from degradation. And so through all of these different mechanisms, VWF has a really important aspect in thinking about how blood clots are forming, both from the platelet side, as well as from more of the coagulation side. So it's a really interesting protein for, for us to study and to really think about. I want to talk about VWF and, and von Willebrand disease and other things in a slightly different context. So I want to talk about kind of how it relates to the general population, kind of general human health and disease. And what I'm showing you here is a population normogram of von Willebrand factor levels. And you can see on the x-axis here, we kind of have the um, levels of VWF that individuals can have and then kind of the frequency or kind of the distribution. And like many things, you can see that it approaches a normal curve with a bit of a skewing to the right here. Now, the normal range of VWF uh, in the general population is usually something like 50 to 150 kind of depicted here. But what's interesting is that when you get outside of this normal range, that's where we get associations with pathophysiologic things or kind of bad outcomes clinically for individuals. And so, for example, when we have very high levels of von Willebrand factor, that is clearly associated with disorders such as myocardial infarctions, strokes, and deep venous thrombosis or DVTs, kind of blood clots in your legs or your lungs. On the flip side, when you have deficiencies of von Willebrand factor, that leads us into the classic um, bleeding diathesis or bleeding disorder of von Willebrand disease. But 
for me, as someone who studies von Willebrand factor regulation, it's really fascinating because once you go either high or low, you kind of get these associations with kind of inappropriate things. And what we'd like to be able to do is to think about how these, um, how von Willebrand factor may be regulated and can we tune them up or down for each individual um, uh, particular uh, issue here. Now, for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna focus a little bit more on the low side or the von Willebrand disease or the bleeding side. Now, I actually had to re recently recreate this slide because I think in a, actually in a past Wednesday webinar, um, it was talked about about the new guidelines for von Willebrand's disease and kind of the new diagnostic criteria. So um, in general, anything less than 50 with a bleeding disorder, um, we tend to think of now as von Willebrand's disease. Now, what's interesting when we think about low von Willebrand factor levels is if your VWF levels are really low, like you know, 10, 5, et cetera, you have a very high likelihood of finding a causative mutation in your von Willebrand factor gene. And that means that you likely have some genetic disorder or genetic problem in your VWF gene that's causing those low von Willebrand factor levels. And you can just show that here by this kind of gray um, shading. However, as your VWF levels increase and you still may be lower than kind of the population norm, so you're still at risk for bleeding, you still kind of have that diagnosis of VWD, your likelihood of having a VWF mutation drops dramatically. And so that raises the obvious question of what might be causing altered VWF levels kind of in maybe more of this population here and kind of on a, on a biochemical level, what mechanism is regulating VWF in this population? Interestingly, even for those individuals who have maybe a very clear causative mutation in VWF that may cause von Willebrand's disease, we know that von Willebrand's disease is a disease that has a high degree of what we call incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity. And basically what that means is you can have the same mutation, but have very different levels. And what that suggests to us is that the mutation is not the only thing that's driving von Willebrand factor levels. And there's additional layers of regulation that we are really trying to identify and study. Now, we're not, clearly not the first group to have studied this before, <clears throat> excuse me. And there actually are very clear other regulatory mechanisms for VWF, the best known being the ABO blood group. But even total, what we see is that we think we've only identified about 30 to 40% of VWF level variation. So there's a kind of an untapped um, bit of knowledge there in understanding how VWF can be regulated uh, even more. And it's our hypothesis that the study of ECFCs, which are endothelial cells from patients with altered VWF levels, will reveal some of these novel regulatory mechanisms. As I told you in a previous slide, if over 80% of your VWF comes from your endothelium, that's really the cell type that we really think we should be focusing on and studying when we're trying to identify novel regulatory mechanisms or novel reasons why VWF may be abnormal. All right, so I've talked a little bit about ECFCs or kind of just like introduced that idea to you. I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more so you understand what they are. So first of all, ECFCs are endothelial colony forming cells. In the title of this talk um, that I gave to Brett and the NHF earlier, um, I called them blood outgrowth endothelial cells. And those are interchangeable terms. Um, we are as a field trying to move more towards ECFCs, but you may still even hear myself kind of use them interchangeably. What ECFCs are, are endothelial cells that we isolate from um, whole blood. So we get whole blood from patients who enroll in our IRB approved study. We actually separate out the plasma layer, the white blood cell layer, and then the red blood cell layer. And we actually plate the white blood cell layer on a culture dish and use different cytokines and endothelial permissive media. And eventually over the course of a few weeks, sometimes even up to a month, we get the outgrowth of endothelial cells that are proliferative and allow us to look at patient-derived endothelium. We verify that they look like endothelial cells kind of just by their physical appearance under a plate, as well as kind of some of the cell surface markers that they have. Now, this technique was kind of first established in the early 2000s, so it's still a relatively new technique. We brought it to our lab here um, around 2015, 2016, uh, when I was here uh, with my mentor, Jorge de Paula, and it's certainly been a, um, uh, a very key model that we use in our lab um, to study uh, VWF and specifically study it from individuals who have altered von Willebrand factor levels. Now, as I mentioned, we've been doing this for about five to six years here at the University of Colorado. And so over time, we've um, created a relatively large ECFC cell bank. And I'm showing you just a list of some of the um, samples that we have here. You can see that the samples that we have span the gamut of very diff of different um, diagnoses, such as control individuals, um, type 1 individuals, low VWF, those are kind of misnamed now. Those are probably just be under the new category, just von Willebrand's disease patients. Um, but we've established, again, a relatively sizable uh, cell bank here. We were obviously limited by COVID, um, like many other places, um, but have started to kind of 
um, re-enroll some patients um, as we are kind of moving forward um, currently. We've also have a nice collaboration with Paula James's lab at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada, who um, was able to share with us some other um, ECFC cells. Um, and so they're putting all this together. We, have, we feel like we have a pretty good cell bank and a good smattering of different um, individuals, ages, diagnoses, et cetera, to really get a good sense of how endothelial cells may regulate BWF specifically in this population. One of the interesting things is myself as being a pediatric hematologist, you can see that our samples here skew a little bit more towards the younger side, the adolescent side, whereas some of the other samples that we have asked us to are a little bit more kind of from adult medicine or older samples. And one of the fascinating things that we haven't even really kind of looked at yet is are there differences in terms of ages in terms of the von Willebrand factor or endothelial regulation? And so that's something that we're going to be looking at going forward and kind of how that may play into the concept of von Willebrand factor regulation in endothelial cells. Now, this is an overarching idea of kind of the current project that we're working on. So um, I, you don't need to obviously memorize this or, or do this, but I just want to set the stage of kind of how we think about this. So when we set out on this particular project, we thought about this concept that von Willebrand factor regulation could be really um, driven by two main concepts, transcriptional regulation and epigenetic regulation. Transcriptional regulation is thinking about kind of how genes activate. So a lot of RNA sequencing and RNA um, evaluation, kind of are genes more active? Are they producing more levels of protein? Epigenetics deals a little bit with kind of the ability of modifiers to activate or deactivate genes. And so we looked at this in kind of three big aims, looking at it first in the transcriptional realm, the second kind of in the epigenetic realm, and the third looking at kind of those concepts in the context of something that we know is actually a fascinating area of study, which is that von Willebrand factor levels increase with age. And we tried to figure out why, that, why that's occurring. Now for the purposes of this talk, kind of tell you a, a bit of the story that we've done so far. I'm really gonna just focus on this first aim, looking at the transcriptional mechanisms or a lot of our RNA data and RNA sequencing data that we've um, uh, been able to generate to date and kind of some of the work that we've done with some of that data. Now, as I mentioned, we've been doing this project for a while. And when we first started this project, I remember distinctly talking with my mentor, Jorge de Paul, and we sat down and said, okay, we're gonna have the ability to really isolate this very cool and novel um, uh, endothelial cell source from individuals. And what we wanted to do in the very beginning was take a very unbiased and kind of big picture approach um, to the cellular samples that we were going to have. And so we really des designed a kind of, um, a kind of a, what's the word, like a system of analysis for all of these samples. And so we do a few things to characterize them generically, like looking at kind of cell surface markers, how much VWF is inside of the cell and the intracellular structures of VWF, how much VWF can be released from these cells. But then we also wanted to take advantage of the fact that in this day and age, we have so much kind of omic based technology. We can look at things like genomics or gene sequencing. So we initially proposed the VWF sequencing, but actually we're just gonna actually probably go ahead and do whole exome or whole genome sequencing because the technology has advanced that far. We wanted to look at things like RNA sequencing or kind of what is the RNA levels in um, these cells. And remember RNA is that messenger that takes your genetic code and translates it to protein. And so variations there could lead to differences in von Willebrand factor. And then we also wanted to look at kind of this epigenetic aspects that I talked about and some other things like microRNAs. And so we're systematically doing this with all of the samples that we obtain here. And in, you can think of this almost kind of individually as almost individual projects, because they're gonna give us this wealth of data to really think about kind of endothelial regulation through all of these different lenses or all these different contexts. Fundamentally, however, at the end of the day, one of the, the, the fundamental kind of comparisons that we always wanna make is thinking about kind of what are control in those cells cells and, and the thought process there is those have normal von Willebrand factor expression, regulation, whatever you wanna kind of kind of homeostasis, if you will. And then we're gonna compare that to an individual or to a set of samples that have altered von Willebrand factor levels. And in this case, we're thinking about those VWD or low von Willebrand factor patients whose levels might be slightly lower, but for a reason that we don't know why yet. And so when we compare and contrast those two, we may get some interesting hits or interesting um, candidates, if you will, some, some, some hints about why um, the von Willebrand factor levels might be lower in these individuals. And that's gonna be very important for us to understand moving forward and try to figure out kind of what is driving some of these things. Again, for the sake of time, we're not gonna go over all of this data. And I'm gonna actually really focus a lot on our single cell RNA sequencing data. It's probably our most, most mature data set to date. And um, I think tells a very interesting story about kind of some of the things that we've been able to do. 
Okay. So single cell RNA sequencing. For those of you who are on this call who may be kind of in, in the research field and, um, and, and know what this is, you're probably, this is probably going to be a little bit maybe of an overview for you. But for everyone else, I really want you to understand kind of what we're doing because I think it's a really cool technique. Um, I think it's really important um, that we've uh, kind of a, a very cool novel technique that we use. So traditionally, when we look at RNA sequencing, we get a bunch of cells and we extract the RNA and then we sequence the RNA from um, all those cells mixed together. And that's kind of what's called bulk RNA sequencing, kind of shown here on the bottom. And what you get is the average gene expression from all of the different cells. And that's fantastic. It's great. That's the very standard approach to RNA sequencing, um, very straight path pathways and pipelines and, and very well established. The difficulty is you're kind of getting this, um, this averaging, right? You don't get kind of the underlying ideas of what each individual cell is doing. So you kind of do some cellular heterogeneity. On the other hand, when you use single cell RNA sequencing, as the name implies, you're actually isolating each individual cell and then looking at the RNA transcriptome or the RNA um, content of that individual cell. And so what you get is kind of a different pattern of RNA expression. So for example, this green cell has this pattern of RNA expression, this blue cell has this pattern, et cetera, et cetera. And what that can tell you in the end is it reveals a lot of heterogeneity and subpopulation kind of variability. Sometimes we call this mosaicism. And it gives you a much richer pattern of the data to say, not just that these cells express gene A at this level, but this subset of genes, excuse me, this subset of cells express gene A at this level and the same for gene set B and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's a very powerful technique. So we took advantage of this technique and we've now sequenced nine individual cell lines for a total of over 12,000 cells. And um, these numbers here really just uh, speak to the kind of degree of sequencing that we were able to obtain. And suffice it to say that we think we actually had a very good sequencing run and I feel very confident about kind of the RNA data that we got out. Now, when we look at RNA sequencing, one of the first things that we wanna look at is clustering, okay? And so I wanna kind of walk you through this diagram so that you kind of understand it well. Each one of these circles represents one of the cells that we sequence. So in a way, there's kind of 12,000 um, circles here. And you can see, what you won't see, but you'll see in a few slides, is that this is a three-dimensional view of it. And what we've taken is all that RNA data, kind of the whole transcriptome or the whole summation of their RNA for each individual and kind of boiled it down into a three-dimensional point. And the concept here we're looking at is clustering. And, and conceptually, things that are closer together are more similar and things that are further apart are more dissimilar. So globally, what we're looking at here is how similar is any one cell's transcriptome to another cell. So in looking at this, one of the things that you can very clearly see is that there's kind of this cluster at the top that I label here cluster one that we highlight here in yellow. And those cells um, upon further analysis were very clearly monocytes. So those are white blood cells. As I mentioned in the very beginning, we um, isolate our endothelial cells from the initial white blood cells. So this might be a little bit of contamination or something like that. But it's very easy when we analyze it this way to kind of cut those genes out, or excuse me, cut those cells out, and then look at the rest. Now, after doing that, one of the first questions we asked was, are we making sure that we're isolating endothelial cells? And so we defined an endothelial cell as expressing uh, any of these kind of highly expressed endothelial genes that you can see here on the bottom based on some published data. And if you expressed any of those genes, um, such as cadherin, PCAM1, et cetera, uh, we deemed you an endothelial cell and you are colored blue in this, um, in this plot. If you did not express any of those, then you redeemed a non-endothelial cell and kind of colored purple. And you can see, interestingly, most of those non-endothelial cells are kind of in this bottom right-hand corner here. Now, again, this is not work that we are, uh, sorry, this is work that we haven't quite done yet in our lab, but there's a fascinating question here about kind of what does it mean to be a non-endothelial cell versus an endothelial cell here? Because what we found is these non-endothelial cells are not, you know, white blood cells. They're not, um, other contaminating cells or anything like that. They just seem like kind of, in a way, almost quiet endothelial cells. And so it really raises that question of kind of, what does it mean to be um, a active versus a quiescent or quiet endothelial cell? Now, one of the first kind of questions we wanted to ask and the one of the first hypotheses we, we um, kind of uh, looked at was, are there differences in the distribution of endothelial versus non-endothelial cells amongst these different cell lines? And it's hard to imagine how this would actually happen in a human being, right? Like a human wouldn't have less endothelial cells than another, but in, the, in, a, in a cell culture dish, we can kind of ask these questions. And so what I'm showing you here are the different cell lines that we have here. And I'm gonna just, um, because we're gonna be using these cell lines, I just wanna introduce them and kind of make sure you're aware of them. So all of the low VWF ECFCs are the endothelial colony forming cells that we isolated from individuals um, who have um, 
vulnerable to bronze disease or low VWF levels. We have two control samples that we isolated from healthy controls who have normal von Willebrand factor levels and no symptoms of clinical bleeding, um, kind of very, again, you know, healthy, normal controls. And then we also have this other cell line that we call HUVEX, which are human umbilical vein endothelial cells. And as the name implies, they're actually isolated from the umbilical veins um, of, uh, of individuals. Um, this is the very classic endothelial cell that is used in research labs across the country. You can buy this commercially. Again, it's the kind of the gold standard um, that is used. So we wanted to include it because it's, uh, again, kind of the, the reference point that a lot of us use for endothelial cell studies. Now, when you look at the breakdown of endothelial versus non-endothelial cells, you can see that overall, there's not a big shift. The vast majority of all of these cell lines had cells that were endothelial in nature. And there wasn't a big switch, you know, in terms of the VWD or low VWF samples having more non-endothelial cells. Um, and actually this made us feel really comfortable with our data, suggesting that our cells that were isolating, which look like endothelial cells, kind of have the cell surface market mm -hmm. of endothelial cells, even at an RNA level, they look like endothelial cells. So again, I mean, we're very confident about the techniques that we've been using to date. Okay, I'm gonna show this to you slightly differently now. So what I'm doing is I took that initial data and I kind of blew it up a little bit here, just kind of zoomed in. And now what I'm doing is actually color coding the different dots based off of the cell line, okay? And so it's gonna spin here a little bit in three dimensional space. And all of these different uh, kind of populations that are in different colors represent individual cell lines, kind of as you can see um, with the um, legend here. And so there's a few things to draw from this and kind of fascinating aspects of it. Number one, it's very clear that kind of populations are different, right? So for example, this kind of light pink here is very different than this kind of uh, light orange, if you will, group down here, kind of both spatially, they're kind of far apart. Now there is a little bit of nuance here in the sense that because these are all endothelial cells, the software automatically tries to kind of like pull them apart, kind of show you the best resolution of them. Um, if we put something like those monocytes back in or some other type, type of cell points, all these are kind of squished together because it would try to give you some sense of scale. But I think at, the, uh, at a very basic level, it's very clear that these populations are different. And that's probably honestly, you know, after thinking about it a bit, not all that surprising. Each of these cell lines comes from a different individual. So those different individuals are going to have different um, a genetic codes, they're gonna have different potential mutations or variations, et cetera, which is gonna probably translate into the RNA data that we are looking at. And so seeing them being different is actually not that surprising. One of the things that's actually really fascinating and highlights the power of single cell RNA sequencing is the fact that we can see the spread or what we call the intrapopulation variation in each of these individual populations. If we did bulk RNA sequencing, what we would get is kind of just one individual dot and say, this is the output of cell line you know, A1. Whereas now, if we take this orange group, for example, you can see that there's a big difference in this orange group, which ultimately came from one sample or one individual. And in fact, you can see that the cells kind of in this portion of this population spread are likely very different than the population down here. And kind of this spread raises some interesting questions of kind of what does it mean to be an endothelial cell, even in this individual, kind of what different uh, expression patterns are we looking at? And what is kind of ultimately fascinating to me is kind of this kind of arbitrary distance between these cells might be just as much as going to another population. And again, so it really raises this question and it's kind of this power of single cell RNA sequencing that we would have kind of not seen, it would have been masked if had we done bulk RNA sequencing. So this is kind of work that we're looking at and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this concept of mosaicism. Now, I told you before that we looked at kind of, are these cells endothelial cells? Um, we looked at it kind of on the cell surface, we looked at it by the RNA sequencing patterns, and we felt very confident about it. One question that we'd always get asked though is kind of, what are these cells like? Are they like other endothelial cells? Because to date, all I've told you is that endothelial cells are endothelial cells. And so we ran actually a very interesting, another analysis where we actually downloaded publicly available RNA sequencing data. So these are from other labs that have sequenced other endothelial cells and uploaded it to the NIH as part of kind of the general data sharing. And so you can see that we have data from kind of lung microvascular cells, um, skin microvascular cells, coronary artery cells, and these are all endothelial cells. This is a two-dimensional PCA plot. So this has the same concept as that three-dimensional plot where the farther apart you are, the more dissimilar you are, the closer together you are, the more similar you are. And what we wanted to do was plot our endothelial cells across all these other endothelial cells to really get a sense of kind of how like are we to these other things. 
what you can see is that our low von Willebrand factor and our control ECFCs kind of cluster right here in this kind of right side pattern or right side portion of the um, graph here, very similar to the HUVEX, which as I told you before, are these gold standard human umbilical vein endothelial cells. This overall was very reassuring to us. What we were obviously really worried about was were we going to be out kind of in, I guess technically this would be left field here, but kind of way out here on this on this pattern. And would people say, look, your cells look very different than all these other things. I don't know what to make of them. And it was actually very reassuring that we're actually very similar to some of the kind of very classic endothelial cells that are used um, again in, in research around the world. However, it's also just even raised further questions, some interesting hypotheses to us in the sense of, again, what does it mean to be a uh, ECFC versus a skin microvascular cell versus a lung microvascular cell. And are there differences in VWF expression in all of these different cell types? And could that be playing a role in the, in the, in the pathophysiology or the, the clinical presentation of von Willebrand disease or individuals with low VWF? It, is, it a, is it a tissue specific issue? Is it an organ specific issue? Is it uh, an artery versus a vein versus a microvascular cell? So these, this, this concept has opened up so many areas of future study for us. And in fact, some of the pilot work that we're doing right now in the lab um, is actually trying to think about how we can kind of drive or create some of these types of endothelial cells and then study what changes in the cells in that context. So this is kind of fascinating work that we're um, already still trying, or already um, starting to kind of work on and think about. Okay, I'm gonna step back or not step back. I'm gonna actually zoom in a little bit. It's probably the better analogy to use. So we've talked all this time about kind of this global pattern of uh, RNA sequencing, this global transcriptomes, all the thousands of genes here. But as I told you at the top, the protein that I really care about is von Willebrand factor. So we're gonna laser focus on VWF right now. And we're gonna use VWF um, as our kind of thought process as we talk about our RNA sequencing data. So one of the first questions and kind of the simplest questions that we wanted to ask is what are the VWF expression levels in these cells? And so what I'm showing you here is exactly that. This is the RNA copy number of the VWF in our control cell lines, which are shown here to the left of this dotted line, kind of all here in black. You can see the two controlled ECFCs and then the HUVEX cell line. And then we have five of our low VWF, VWD ECFC lines here. And on the Y axis here is the kind of copy number of the amount of VWF RNA in each of these cells. Now this is averaged across all the different cells that we sequence here. Overall, you can see some heterogeneity or the fact there's some you know, kind of variability in the amount of VWF expression in the low VWF ECFCs. But when you group them together, there's very clearly a decrease in the amount of VWF RNA copy number in the low von Willebrand factor ECFCs. And this was a fascinating finding for us because it really kind of correlates well, right? These are coming from individuals who have decreased von Willebrand factor in their plasma. They have von Willebrand's disease or low VWF levels. And what we're seeing is perhaps the first hint of one of the reasons why they might have that. And that's a decreased copy number of VWF, which we term in the context of thinking of them as maybe having transcriptional downregulation of VWF in their endothelial cells. However, this is a bulk RNA experiment, right? I kind of, as I told you, this averages everything together. This doesn't take advantage of the um, kind of power and the uniqueness of the single cell RNA sequencing. And so what I want to show you next is um, a slide where we actually kind of take advantage of the fact that we sequenced over 12,000 cells and have 12,000 individual levels of von Willebrand factor expression. So what I'm showing you here are the control endothelial cells and their VWF expression. This is a histogram very similar to that normal curve that I showed you earlier. On the x-axis is the VWF expression. Um, and then on the y-axis is kind of the number of counts or kind of you know the, the binning, if you will. And if you look at the overall pattern of the rectangles behind it, and I know this is sometimes a little bit hard to see, you can see kind of an interesting pattern, what I call a kind of bimodal or two-peaked approach where there's this peak at zero, kind of this level at zero, it kind of drops down, then it comes, comes back up in this eight to 10 range and then falls off um, uh, to the right-hand side. Now, because we use the mixed modeling algorithm, so this is kind of all algorithmically derived, we don't kind of create these on our own. What we can also do is ask the algorithm, are there subpopulations that make up the overall pattern? So this is the overall pattern of the expression are there kind of normal curves that are based under the, underneath that? And what you can see is that the model or the algorithm predicts four individual um, subgroups or subpopulations. The first being this kind of big peak here, or tall peak, but narrow peak uh, shown here in pink. This next one here shown in teal. This next one shown here in purple. And then this kind of uh, low amplitude, but high expression green population here. Um, and these are the kind of four that make up this overarching curve. 
So again, this is a fascinating finding from single cell RNA sequencing, right? We're not just getting one value, we're getting this concept of what are all the individual cells doing and how does that kind of break down amongst all the different cells. But these are the control cells, right? These are the kind of normal BWF expression cells. These are not individuals or not uh, cells that we think of having alterations in BWF. So we obviously did the same uh, evaluation in our low BWF ECFCs. Graph is overarchingly the same in terms of the, the axes and the concept. And if you follow the pattern here though, it's a little bit different. Again, you see this peak kind of at zero and then you kind of having, you have a, excuse me, you have a fall off instead of having a dip and then a second peak here. So in effect, you kind of lose this second peak that you otherwise see here in the control cells. And this was a fascinating discovery for us. And, and why is this so fascinating? So number one, it's obviously different, right? There's less von Willebrand factor expression, or you kind of get this left shifting of the data. And what did this really appears to be, there appears to be some kind of driver or mechanism that is leading to downregulation of BWF in these low von Willebrand factor ECFCs. But there's actually not even another kind of more fascinating aspect about this, and that's the way that it's happening. Right? Because if you think about ways that you can kind of decrease von Willebrand factor, if we use the control cells as an example, there's many different ways, but kind of two overarching analogies I like to use is thinking about kind of decreasing the volume or using a light switch. So if you decrease the volume, what it would do is kind of just like cut down um, the amplitude of all of these curves, but the, the overall pattern would be the same. It's kind of like taking volume from a 10 to a nine to a seven uh, to a five, et cetera, and kind of ratcheting your way down. And that's kind of one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is more akin to a light switch where you can literally turn it on or off. There's kind of two settings. And it actually, this data, at least to us, suggests that it's more of an on-off mechanism, right? You don't have kind of a change in the, you have a dramatic change in the pattern, not just necessarily kind of a smooshing of the pattern, if you will. And there's some very interesting kind of mechanistic ideas about kind of what is driving these when we think about on-off versus kind of volume adjustments. And so this has actually been very helpful for us in kind of narrowing some of the hypotheses that we have about how von Willebrand factor might be regulated um, and kind of, you know, leading us more down certain pathways as opposed to others. So certainly extremely fascinating data, um, again, that we've gotten from our single cell data. We also wanted to look at this in a slightly different context. So not just like is the overall population different, but highlighting subpopulations, we wanted to ask the question of, are there subsets of populations that we really should be focused on? Kind of, is there a lot of noise and just some signal or are all the cells kind of um, doing the same thing? And so what we did was we used the um, software packages uh, to analyze our RNA sequencing data and assigned clustering to cells. So I showed you a three-dimensional version of clustering. This is nothing more than a two-dimensional version of it, just to make it a little bit easier to see. You can see that the software assigns, in this case, eight different uh, clusters um, based on the overall patterns of the RNA. And then looking at each individual cluster, which I'm showing you here, we looked at the VWF expression of the control cells and the low von Willebrand factor cells in each cluster and wanted to say, is there a particular cluster that we should be focused on that might have more or less of that differential expression? You know, is there a group of cells that is really showing us that, that, that change when we're doing a compare and contrast um, analysis? And in fact, there did seem to be that. So I'm gonna use clusters three and four here, primarily just as an example. So cluster three is here, kind of shown here in this kind of um, lighter green color. Cluster four is a darker green kind of here in the middle. And you can see that cluster three in this violin plot has relatively similar VWF expression in the control cells versus the low von Willebrand factor cells. These are violin plots, so they're kind of like bar plots. Um, you're looking kind of obviously as the, as the difference in, you know, the differences in the plotting, um, but these look relatively similar, suggesting there's not a lot of difference between control and low VWF. On the other hand, if you take cluster four and also clusters five and six, you can see that there's a pretty marked difference in the amount of von Willebrand factor expression in the controls versus the low VWF. And as established before, the controls have higher levels. And so it's really maybe like these group of cells here that we really should be focusing in on, should really be thinking about. And maybe kind of these cells, although very fascinating and interesting, maybe kind of diluting some of our data. And we, you know, kind of now have a more narrow focus of, okay, these are the cells that are really the drivers of what's going on. Can we identify kind of what they are, what state they're in, what um, other things are going on in them? And again, the power of single cell is to be able to kind of slice and dice this a little bit and kind of really focus in on some of the signals that we think are really important. And so 
to date, this has been a super fascinating kind of study for us and kind of looking at the ability to use single cell RNA sequencing data to really tease out kind of what are the important cells and the important concepts in von Willebrand factor regulation. Now, our goal ultimately, as I mentioned before, is to really identify kind of mechanisms or, or candidates or genes, if you will, that we think are gonna have large contributions to VWF regulation, something that is gonna change VWF up or down um, ultimately in a, in a clinically relevant way. And so one of the ways that we simply do this is to look for genes that are different between the two combinations, right? I always talk about this compare and contrast um, idea. And what I'm showing you here is a volcano plot. And this volcano plot is meant to visually represent all of the statistically significant differentially expressed genes between the two populations of control endothelial cells and VWD or low VWF ECFCs. So every single one of these dots you can think of as a candidate at, to potentially be a regulator of VWF. Now there's a lot of dots here and I'm by no means suggesting that you know, all of these are gonna pan out or that you know, these are all kind of great candidates. But this is a great list to start from, right? Because these are the things that are different when we compare these two populations. And so we have genes that may be more highly expressed in control cells or genes that may be more highly expressed in low von Willebrand factor cells. Now the y-axis here tells you kind of the strength of the statistical difference. And then the x-axis tells you the difference in kind of how much different they are, what we call the fold changer. You know, is it multiplied five times or 10 times or just one time? And so ultimately what we are looking for are things that are kind of out into the top. So these are gonna be kind of our strongest candidates in this range, because those are the things that are gonna be the most different both from a statistical as well as just kind of a general um, change when we're comparing two populations. And what's also important is that we really don't care kind of the directionality. We don't care if you're more highly expressed in control cells or if you're more highly expressed in low von Willebrand factor cells. Kind of both could lead us to some interesting ideas. So for example, if we have a gene or a target, maybe this one here, that um, is more highly expressed in control cells. Well, maybe that's a gene that's involved in causing von Willebrand factor levels to increase or kind of upregulating von Willebrand factor levels. Or on the flip side, if we have a gene or a target that's more expressed in low VWF, like maybe these two here, maybe those genes are associated or potentially even causative of decreased von Willebrand factor levels. And so kind of from both aspects, we get very fascinating ideas about kind of next steps and mechanisms that might regulate von Willebrand factor level. So really, we, we you know, although <laughs> honestly a very large number of genes and targets to study, um, this was a, a very important output for us to, to think, okay, we have actually now a really good list of things to think about. How do we move this forward? And the way that we did that was honestly by looking at the list and kind of picking out things that we thought might be good candidates. And that's based off of kind of work that we've done in the past, work that others have published about von Willebrand factor regulation. And we've come up with basically a target list of different candidates that we have, kind of showing you here, uh, candidate one, two, three, et cetera, et cetera, kind of shown here in coloration. And then what we did was we designed what's called an siRNA screen. And for those of you who work in the lab, we've done this in 96 well plates for increased efficiency. And so we use siRNAs, which basically are used to knock out specific genes. And so we play regular, healthy control endothelial cells. And then we use siRNAs to knock out the gene in all of these cells and then ask what happens to that von Willebrand factor. And because we do this in a 96 well plate, that lets us kind of use this in a high throughput fashion to so be able to look at how much VWF is released from the cells, how much VWF remains in the cells or what happens to the VWF content of the cells themselves. And then what happens also to that VWF mRNA level, kind of the transcriptome of those cells after we knock them out. Now we use multiple candidates or multiple, excuse me, multiple siRNAs for each candidate. And this allows us to kind of look at, okay, what's a really good candidate now on a functional screen? All the data that we did before was looking at just the RNA. Now we're looking at what actually happens to the protein itself. Does the protein go up or down? Does it change at all when we kind of change any of these candidates? And this allows us to quickly screen candidates and say, for example, well, candidate one knocked out you know, none, candidate two knocked out just one of four, but candidate three knocked out all four of them. That seems like a really good candidate that we should move forward with. And honestly, this is a lot of the work that we're currently doing in our lab is kind of combing through this list that we've generated and looking at all of our high level targets and kind of systematically going through them in a relatively high throughput fashion to really identify some of those candidates that um, may we, we may want to study further because they may have true or very significant biological relevance. Now for the purposes of an example, I'm gonna show you one of them. 
And that's a, a gene that's called FLY1. FLY1 uh, encodes or creates a transcription factor. It's called friend leukemia integration one transcription factor. It's actually kind of well known in things like um, some cancers actually. Um, but uh, FLY1 was a gene that was differentially regulated in our von Willebrand factor um, differential gene expression. And what's interesting is upon looking back and looking back at some of the data, some of the ETS transcription factors, and FLY1 is a member of these ETS transcription factors, have been shown to have some effect on von Willebrand factor regulation, specifically in the BWF promoter, which basically means it kind of activates the gene. Um, transcription factors kind of latch onto different parts of DNA and activate expression of certain genes. And so, as I mentioned before, we use our siRNA screen to look at what happens to VWF levels after we knock down FLY1. And so what I'm showing you here is our knockdown experiments here. And so you can see that when we knock down FLY1, as compared to kind of a dummy siRNA, we get a decrease in the amount of von Willebrand factor level that is expressed in the cells. We also get a decrease in the amount that's released from the cells, although this was not statistically significant. But FLY1 seems to have an effect on the protein levels of VWF after we knock it down, suggesting that it may play a role in regulation. The next thing we did was we created what's called a reporter assay, which is kind of marrying the VWF promoter region to a green fluorescent protein. And the idea here is that if the gene is active, you, the cells will create lots of gene, uh, excuse me, green protein that you can easily look at with um, different techniques. And so what we did was we used these cells and then knocked down FLY1 and said, how active is the gene after we knock it down? And what you can see is that after FLY1, after we knock down FLY1, we get a dramatic decrease in the kind of activity of the gene as measured by the fluorescence levels here, suggesting that FLY1 may regulate von Willebrand factor at the level of kind of gene activation or at the level of the VWF promoter. Now I wanna be very clear that I'm by no means suggesting that FLY1 is the, the primary, uh, maybe even I would say a significant um, driver of VWF expression. We really use this kind of as a validation of the work that we've done so far. And we think this is actually really cool because this is a target that we identified on our RNA sequencing data. We kind of validated it a little bit more on a protein level using our siRNA screen. And then we've actually even taken it a little bit further and looked at it in the context of what mechanisms could be um, directly uh, related to this. And so we're, we're gonna conceptually do this for all these other targets that we think are gonna be good candidates going forward. And this represents a lot of the work uh, that we're currently doing in our lab right now. All right, well, thank you very much for kind of staying with me through this entire talk. I'm at my conclusions. Um, I've talked a lot about this you know, through the course of uh, my talk already, um, but just to summarize them, I think We've shown that we can do kind of RNA sequencing analysis or transcriptional analyses that reveal many highly differentially expressed genes. And those are those candidates or those pathways that we're really focusing on in our low von Willebrand factor and the thelial cells. We've used the power of single cell RNA sequencing to not only talk about just are, is there a downregulation of VWF in these cells, but more importantly, kind of what does that look like? How heterogeneous is the expression? Is there mosaicism? And those are some of the fascinating um, uh, results that we've gotten using this very cool and novel technique. I've shown you an example of FLY1 as again being merely just an example of a candidate that we took through this validation stage and kind of hopefully validating some of the work and the pathways that we designed in our labs or more systems that we've designed, designed in our lab to look at other candidates as well. And right now, as I mentioned, we're working a lot on future functional screening to again think about those other candidates that really may um, be able to be identified as uh, either from a pathophysiologic way or just kind of a strength of um, differential expression way that are really going to be those high value targets. And conceptually, we want to validate these and kind of move these through and understand the mechanisms of why they occur, because this is the classic situation of potentially being able to bring work that we do at the bench to the bedside, right? If we can think about ways to modulate von Willebrand factor levels, or if we can identify ways that von Willebrand factor levels are regulated, we can think about ways that we might be able to modulate them. Um, so this is kind of fascinating work that, again, um, we are currently working on in our lab right now. I'll finally end with my acknowledgement slide. Um, this has been obviously work that I've primarily done in my lab. I'd like to thank Emily Carnahan, Laura Cox, Alice Liu, and Katrina Bark, all of who are research assistants who have done uh, so much of this work. But this work truly um, was a collaborative effort across kind of even different um, geographical locations. But a lot of people here at the University of Colorado have been extremely helpful on this. Obviously, I want to thank my mentor, Jorge de Paula, 
under whom um, I kind of started this project. Jorge was here at the um, University of Colorado, but has now moved to the Washington University uh, in St. Louis. I also want to give a special recognition to our hemophilia and thrombosis center clinical research team who have been instrumental in helping me kind of identify and enroll, maintain the IRBs for all of uh, the patients that we have so that we're doing this obviously in the, in the correct way. So Christine Norton, Julie Smith, Molly Brown, and Tim Smith, thank you very much. And then I'll finally just end by again, acknowledging the funding sources that have supported this project as well as my career to date. Again, with a special focus on the National Hemophilia Foundation, which um, you know I've certainly been a, a recipient of research support in the past, and I'm deeply appreciative of being able to kind of show this work that's been based off of that. And with that, I am done. I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Um, uh, I will actually I will actually stop sharing my screen here. Um, and thank you again for the time. Uh, thank you very much for your attention in uh, in listening to me today. Yeah, that was, that was great, Dr. Ring. Thank you so much. A lot of rich information in there. We do have a few questions that have come in. Um, I'll start with the one in the, in the Q&A bank here. It says, are you noticing differences between males and females, races and ethnicities? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I would say we haven't even looked at that yet. And that's certainly um, an area that I, um, to some extent, uh, had thought about before in the initial process. But um, uh, yeah, that's a fantastic thing. So I can, I would say right now we, we do not, but that's mo mostly out of ignorance in terms of not looking. Um, certainly as we increase the number of samples that we look at in terms of our, um, our um, cell bank, uh, I think we're going to get a better sense of that um, with the kind of relatively small numbers of nine that we have in kind of our analysis so far in our single cell data. Um, I'm not sure if we can draw super strong conclusions, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be looking. So that's a fantastic question. Great. Thanks, Dr. Ring. The next question that comes in, how do the new VWD guidelines affect the way you label the specimens in your ECFC bank, or does it? And the second part is, do they have any other implica implications in the way you conduct your studies since their publication? Yeah, um, fantastic question, because it certainly has been something that I thought about as soon as I um, even kind of read them and thought about them. I think from a, from a conceptual standpoint, um, they, they don't have a, a dramatic impact on what we're studying. To some extent, while we are obviously studying von Willebrand's disease, that's always kind of been my focus of my career, studying von Willebrand's disease and von Willebrand factor. At a very scientific level, I'm looking at kind of the level of the protein. So if the protein level is 40 versus 20 versus 49 versus 51, um, regardless of kind of the clinical diagnosis that's necessarily associated with that patient. Um, for me, it's more kind of what's affecting that von Willebrand factor amount. Um, having said that, um, we definitely need to go through and kind of reclassify our samples kind of to be consistent with um, these guidelines, because I think, you know, they certainly have come out with a lot of great people and a lot of good thought. Um, and so, um, you know, I think it will certainly force us to, think about our patients a little bit differently and kind of maybe relabel them in terms of nomenclature. But I don't think it affects dramatically the scientific questions that we're asking in terms of how von Willebrand factor may be regulated. It does highlight for us, um, however, that we really should be focused, you know, in our research at least, we really are focused primarily on the level of VWF. So some of those individuals may have been called like low von Willebrand factor levels, as I referred to in my talk. Um, and, and, and um, you know, those conceptually may be still the individuals we're thinking about. Um, but we should be using the most up-to-date guideline and nomenclature that we have. Great. Thanks, Dr. Ng. Um, I'll remind everyone if they have any questions, please throw them into the Q&A feature there. Um, we do have another question that has come in, and that is, what are the practical implications of your work to improve care and treatment for people living with VWD? Yeah, I think, you know, unfortunately right now, I don't think there's a lot you can draw from kind of the work that we're doing directly into the care, but that certainly... I, I, I kind of view this as, as in many aspects of science, you know, a lot of the work we're doing is trying to understand that basic biology, which I don't feel like we have a really good understanding of that, which is why I'm so excited to do this work. But if we can understand that at a very basic level in time, that'll help us to understand, for example, are there particular genes that are really associated with VWF and can we design you know, drugs or other things or, or identify other situations where that may come into play um, that's going to really be, I think, the important factor. And in fact, when we go through and think about, as I mentioned, kind of those lists of candidates, we are doing it, to be honest, in a somewhat biased way with that in, in mind, in thinking about, okay, what are things that are, you know, can be meaningful to people? What are things that um, 
have the ability to maybe be modulated more easily than other things. And so we are, as a physician scientist, you know, and, and seeing patients, I'm always kind of mindful of the fact that ultimately my hope is that this kind of translate into something that's actually, you know, clinically useful. And so I always have kind of that lens or that spin on it as I look through and, and go through my work here in the lab. Great. Great. Thanks, Dr. Ng. We don't have any other questions that came in, but I'll ask Dr. Valentino if he wanted to chime in with anything at all. And, and, and if you had any questions, Len. No, um, Chris, it was a great presentation. I think the question that I had was the last one is, you know, what's the potential translation of this into either advanced diagnostics or therapeutics um, into the future? Do you see, I guess I'll ask, do you see that this potentially could enhance our ability to diagnose people with von Willebrand disease that are currently um, evading diagnosis? <clears throat> I think what it'll help us to understand is, is in some way, those individuals. Um, you know, I think especially at those individuals who are at the higher level of the diagnostic criteria for VWD, um, the reasons why their levels might be lower are kind of myriad now. And um, I think to some extent, we miss some of those individuals just by not screening them or just, you know, not hearing about them. I think if we can identify kind of pathways, you know, if there's um, some familial thing or something like that, 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 that is associated with having lower von Willebrand factor levels, which we might find in some of this RNA sequencing data, I think that'll help us kind of think about patients um, on a little bit of a more population level to say, oh, you know, these individuals with these mutations are at risk for having lowered von Willebrand factor levels, or, or the, this, if this pathway is altered, this is a concern for von Willebrand factor. So I think it's going to help us um, think about that situation in terms of, you know, uh, identifying populations maybe that are slightly at risk for, for having these diagnoses. Whereas right now we kind of don't have any knowledge of that. Okay. And in terms of treatment, like I said before, you know, I think that's really where we're going to be looking at kind of those high value targets, things that may be either have inhibitors or other drugs that are already designed against those things and seeing if, you know, those have any implication in um, von Willebrand factor. And can we use those um, for, you know, they may be designed for other things right now, but um, certainly that's work that we'd like to kind of think about. And maybe one other question. Do you think that this technology, sort of the approach that you took has potential applicability for, let's say rare or ultra rare bleeding disorders? I think so. I think, you know, um, <laughs> this is a bit of an aside, but you know, when I, when I go to a lot of talks and, and honestly, a lot of this, these concepts came out of talks that I would talk about with my oncology colleagues who are doing these kind of fascinating, similar studies on rare tumors or, you know, different types of tumors. I think the concept holds for a lot of the different diseases that we study, um, you know, obviously in hematology, but even across other things and understanding um, a little bit more of you know, I think one of the benefits of what we're doing here is a lot of the classic uh, chemostasis research to date has been done on a ton of proteins, which is fantastic and amazing. Um, what I'm trying to do is look at it a little bit more at the cellular level. And we, you know, potentially could do the same thing for all or many other different types of bleeding disorders. So I think it's absolutely an area where we think about how, um, how all these different um, cellular and regulatory aspects inside of cells may affect all these other proteins. Thank you. This was, this was great. Thank you, Dr. Ng. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us this afternoon and appreciate your, your time and, and your expertise, sir. Um, so thank you for joining us. No, thank you very much again for the opportunity to speak and thanks for everyone for attending. Great, great. And please note that this recorded webinar will be available on Friday, December 10th at hemophilia.org under the events tab with all of our other archive webinars. Also available in the events tab is our upcoming schedule for our weekly Wednesday webinars. Thanks again, Dr. Ng. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you.